Welcome everybody. Um, just before we start formally, um, if you have a white Tahoe, New York license plates, um, KHM2756 is blocking somebody in, and um, at least be able to get out if you could move it, that would be great. So welcome to everybody. This is a great crowd. Parents and grandparents and family members, students and friends. Welcome to Putney's 87th graduation. And I welcome remotely to those that weren't able to travel to be with us today. And welcome to the class of 2022. To you seniors, and you're still seniors for a few more minutes, um, please take a minute um, before we start to thank the faculty and the staff that have helped you get to this place today. So take the time today to thank your parents and your grandparents and whoever else it has been that has helped you and made it possible for you to be here. 
And to all the families, I want to give you the thanks of all of us who live and work here at Putney. You have been wonderfully supportive of the school during good times and especially during hard times. And you've trusted us with your children, which is a huge leap of faith, especially in these last few years. And to the seniors, congratulations, you made it. Um, you've done that with both considerable courage and considerable style. 35 of you are four-year seniors. You arrived in the fall of 2018. And, and you remember the before times. And in many ways, that means that you've been the institutional memory of a place through the pandemic. And as such, you've been of enormous value, really, to this whole school community and to Putney's future. I find in my notes that those of you that were here as ninth graders were unusually accident-prone. <laughs> there were six trips to the ER in the month of September alone that year. And we didn't start till halfway through September. You seem to have become more nimble, thankfully. <laughs> I told you at convocation that first year that if we all of us simply agreed to tell the truth, not to use social media for destructive reasons, and to treat everyone with respect, just those three things, that we would be taking a radical stance against the status quo in the United States at that point. And by and large, you did that. And I think that influenced the students that joined the class later and modeled for younger students that came in. Another 12 of you arrived in the fall of 2019 and were quickly absorbed into the class. And another 10 came as 11th graders in the fall of 2020. These are unusual numbers. The pandemic made people reevaluate and move around much more than usual. And we benefited by that, by having you join the community. And last fall, having six more students come as seniors is a record, as far as I'm aware. Um, and you brought grit and laughter and talent, and you quickly made Putney your own as well. The other side of all of this change was the fact that some of you have been stuck here for a really long time. <laughs> Couldn't go home, literally, for years. And Putney became your home um, even more than it is for everybody else. And you've become part of the community here in a different way. And I have enormous admiration for your courage and your grit. <laughs> when we did the final faculty review of the senior class, we, what we saw in our review was a class of young adults who were very much who they are. It's a collection of very vivid personalities. You're earnest, rarely cynical, and open and genuine about wanting to learn how to be good people. And the faculty's affection for you was very clear. When pictures went up on the wall, people said, "Oh, <laughs> it was very sweet. And we have been patient and forgiving with you when you needed that. And you also see each other clearly and are patient and forgiving as well, at least most of the time. So what's next? One of my heroines, Jane Addams, said, we stand today united in a belief in beauty, genius, and courage, and that these can transform the world. And I would say that to you now. Jane Addams was the founder of Hull House, a settlement house in Chicago, which she created in 1889 to support new immigrants and help them become Americans. It had civic education, health care, daycare, communal meals, music, and job training. She believed that education should not be separated from life, but be part of life itself. Jane Addams had a young woman who worked with her as her secretary. And that young woman was Carmelita Hinton in her first job fresh out of college. Jane Addams went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and Carmelita went on to found the Putney School. And she brought these ideas with her. 
the seeds of our fundamental beliefs had been planted, as was the idea of sing. The music director at Hull House would tell children, sing and you will be good. When you started high school, whether it was here or someplace else in the fall of 2018, Trump was president, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. None of us had heard of George Floyd or could have predicted the power of the racial reckoning our country would embark on after his death. None of us had heard the word COVID. You've been in high school at a time when things were happening so fast that you have been learning alongside adults as much as from adults, alongside the leaders of this country and other countries. And that's been frustrating sometimes, but also I think exciting and you've learned a lot. I'm basically an optimist, um, which you might guess from the fact that I have spent my whole life with teenagers. <laughs> and in my optimistic imagination, I see that your generation may do what the generation of students in the 1960s did. They united young people around the country and to some extent the world. And with that power of youth, they made fundamental change. The US is now deeply divided by geography and by party. In the 1960s, it was divided by age. Young people saw the failures of the older generations. They resolved not to trust anybody over the age of 30, and they changed the entire culture of the country. The civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and new feminism all came out of the 1960s. And what was called counterculture included other things like rock and roll, non-American food, and the recognition that many people are not heterosexual. Today's polls show that people under 30 in this country are in agreement on a surprising number of the major issues of the day, regardless of what state or city they live in and what political party their parents are part of. This has enormous potential if that potential gets organized. And I'm really eager to see what's gonna happen next, what your generation will make happen next. And I hope that you are all Part of it in whatever way feels most important to you. You're headed out to a wide variety of wonderful colleges and universities and heading off to adventures across the world. I hope you'll keep in touch with each other and with the other people here. We're proud of you. I'm proud to be graduating with you and I wish you all farewell. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. What a beautiful day. Uh, amazing. So glad to see all these faces and bodies and no masks, and it's just nice. So good morning. Glad you're all here. Parents, grandparents, siblings, family members, and friends, you have all, no doubt, played a role in bringing us to this day. It is with your support and all the support of the remarkable faculty, staff, and administration of the Putney School that will allow this group of students to graduate on this wonderful day. Thank you all. I want to take this moment to recognize that this will be the last class to graduate under Emily's exceptional leadership. Her and her beloved Gordon's 15-year tenure here at Putney School have strengthened and improved the educational experience of a Putney student beyond words. Her steadfast supervision has shepherded Putney in its mission, its health as an institution, and its reputation to new highs. Please join me in acknowledging the deep wisdom and caring that Emily has shared with us during her time here, and join me in wishing her all of our best for the new chapter that she will be beginning soon.
I've been struggling to find the right words for this day. So many aspects of the world around us feel as if they're at a breaking point, and yet life goes on. We're not headed into an easy time. You are, however, well equipped. Your time here at Putney has provided you with skills that, you are, sh that are sure to help you navigate a complex world. Many of these skills may not even occur to you at this time, but as years pass, you will come to recognize advantages that your time here has given you. I graduated from Putney 40 years ago in 1982. I have a reunion next week. <laughs> my, my mother graduated in 1954, my wife 1987. We have one son who graduated last year and one who will graduate next year. So I know firsthand that the education that you have gotten and the friends you have made will be with you throughout your life. For such a small institution, I truly believe that the web that Putney spins is both surprisingly large and remarkably resilient. As you head off to college or a gap year, trade school, the workforce, or otherwise, you will find subtle differences between how you perceive the world around you and how your peers do. It's hard to know which skills in life will ultimately serve you best. You have all learned that you have an important and meaningful voice. You know how to advocate for yourself. You know that you can speak truth to power and that it, in fact, makes a difference. It may not always feel that way, but it does. You have learned that many hands make light work. You know how to do hard work and that there is no work out there that is either above or below you. You understand that everyone must do their part or the system does not function. When you leave Putney, you will notice that some of those around you don't necessarily understand these realities. There are opportunities in today's world to make tremendous and positive changes. The necessity of advancing the technologies we see evolving and the blatant need for innovative and thoughtful people standing up for what is right has never been more evident. You can make a difference in the world. That may be as simple as being a good and loving friend to someone in need, creating beautiful art, being able to size up a given problem and be part of the solution, or it may mean that you need to be a tenacious and outspoken activist. Try to be honest with yourself and others and urge those around you to do the same and be sure to involve yourself in your community and make your vote count. I wish you all the best on your journey to successful and rewarding years ahead. Congratulations, class of 2022. Now we'd like to introduce our senior speakers, Jason Gross and Mark Crail. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Josh. I was a big fan of your son, Ledley. <laughs> For four years, I have been living here on this campus and you're going to be so prepared has been repeated to me several times over them. Nine times out of 10, when I told older people I attended a boarding school, I'd get that phrase tossed out as a response. Prepared for what, I used to ask. College was a frequent answer. Life was a runner up. Prepared how was something I asked myself. Every day I'd look at what I was doing and think, how is this preparing me for life? A very existential question, especially as a freshman at Putney, when doing something like watering lettuce plants with piss or getting headbutted in the crotch by a jersey calf. <laughs> in some ways, people telling me I'd be so prepared for life made me ex feel exceptionally unprepared. The implication was that I would have no room to stumble or make jump choices once I had left Putney, that I needed to get all my growing out here and dread the day I have to leave the bubble. At some point before my senior spring, but after my junior winter, my most frequently heard phrase turned into, Oh, won't you be so sad to leave? Sometimes they'd add variety with, won't it be hard to leave? 
Looking back at my time at Putney, I feel impossible to be sad about. I realize now that the freedom and leadership the Putney School offers its students has prepared me for something, leaving and taking it with me. The Putney School isn't great because it has got a dairy farm. It isn't great because it's in the woods or because half the dorms were barns. <laughs> it's made great by the people it brings to it and the way we uphold and live by the institution's values of creativity and sincerity. The exceptional character of the people learning, living, and working at the school is exemplified when you know they were handpicked for the school by people examining them for their values and character, not just merits and acclaim. It's ridiculous how many times over the years I've been quoted or have had the Putney ideals quoted at me by students. There isn't much more to say about the people here other than I'm sure that if I collapsed up on this podium right now, every student's first instinct would be run, to run toward me to help, not to recoil. Students make up the admissions committee, the hiring committees, the disciplinary committees. They, we, choose what the school looks like. A school that offers extensive farming and fiber arts opportunities isn't much without a students who are passionate about and dedicated to using the opportunities the school offers. Similarly, how would a school that governs the students primarily with an honor code not fall into chaos unless those students were honorable? So I'm not sad to be leaving because nothing can take away the fact that I just spent one sixth of my life with people who believe in the philosophy of doing with passion and respect for the ideals of Putney and their own morals. And I know that this school has shown me exactly what people I do and do not want to be around in my adult life. And what space for myself, what a space for myself, in, sorry, what a space for myself in the world that fulfills and pushes me looks like. So let's not be sad today, okay? <laughs> let's be happy, because we made it through two deans, three music directors, numerous drug busts, a pandemic, and we came out on top. <laughs> Let's not think of ourselves as the end of an era of Putney, but the inspiration for a new step to Putney and its legacy off of the hill. Thank you. And now I'm so happy to introduce Mark Quill. Thanks, Jason. Uh, before I begin the speech, I would like to congratulate my class. Guys, we made another four years. I have lived at the Putney School for three years. Most of you have lived here for four. To the older folks in the crowd, that doesn't seem significant. But to us seniors, we're 17, 18, 19. Uh, for me, that's 15.78% of my life. Most of the seniors are in the same boat as I am. Uh, we went to high school here. Most of us, not me, went through puberty here. Um, a lot of firsts happened on this campus. This school is our frame of reference. We are used to dealing with the administrators and the teachers. We are wired to understand the schedule. We've gotten good at functioning here. We have built many lives here for the past three to four years. Uh, this is our home, our frame of reference. I think of someone who I personally know as a good artist, and they probably go to this school. I think of someone who, is, who I find to be incredibly intelligent, they go to this school. I think of someone I like, they will most likely go here. <laughs> the inverse is also true. Um, I assume it's the same for all you here. That, that's what community is. It's the people you surround yourself with and become accustomed to living with. Um, it's going to be sad adjusting out of that. The beautiful thing about community is that once you get some distance from it, and when you bump into the person that annoyed you 10 years down the road, all you're, gonna, all you're going to remember is the shared experience of going to this incredible, weird school, and you're going to have a lovely conversation about it. And I know this to be true. When my closest buddy, one of my closest buddies, uh, I couldn't stand him through when I went to school with him. But a year later, I was staying with his family at Shelter Island. I, don't get me wrong, all the things I didn't like about him are still true. But, 
we, I can empathize with him because we went through a weird experience together. And that is exactly what we have here. <laughs> I went through COVID, three dates, all the things Jason said. Um, yeah, that means something. We lived here for four years. I don't want to put words in people's mouths and say what they feel about this place or what this school means to us. I imagine every one of us seniors has differing views and feelings about Putney. That's your business. But I am certain that regardless of our love or possible hatred towards this school, it is significant to us simply because we spent the last, four, hopefully, 4% four of our lives at the Putney School. You gotta admit, this is a weird place. I challenge you to find somewhere where you are as where who you are as a person is valued more than what you do or what grades you get. A place where the cultural norm is to treat people as individuals, a place where the norm is to give kids and teenagers respect and authority without having to pay dues or earn it, a place where you can make so many mistakes, sometimes illegal, and still be treated with <laughs> kindness and empathy by the teachers and given the benefit of the doubt. A place where you can screw up so much and still have teachers listen to your opinions even if they aren't fully formed because at the Putney School, um, the Putney School values coming to conclusions on your own without them being forced upon you. A place where you can run around naked, do zombie tag, whatever the hell that is, walk around singing and scream horrific things with your friends that there's no excuse to say while sober and not be bullied or ostracized by the teachers or your peers. I challenge you to find a place where you're encouraged to be creative, actually creative, knowing well that the product might be terrible or perverse in some way, because the process is valued more than the result. What this place is, we got to be kids here through high school, and I can't think of anywhere else where that's true. I'm going to miss that about this school. For the past couple of years, the Putney School was our house arguably more so than where our biological families live because we spent more time here and, um, and now we are leaving and somewhere else is gonna be our house. We all are going our separate ways and I'm very excited to, to see the amazing things that we do with our lives. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at reunions. Go out there and take on the world knowing you came from a damn good home and a weird quasi family of people in Vermont. I've lived with you guys for three years. I'm gonna miss you guys and all in your own weird individual ways. Thank you. are going to lead us in singing Red River Valley, and you should have that in your program. Okay. 
Arangos will introduce our guest speaker for the day. Caleb Manson is many things. Today, he serves as the Associate Professor of Practice in Music and Director of Music Performance at Clark University. He serves as the Music Director of the King Choral, as the Music Director of Bar and Opera, and as the Artistic Director of the New England Repertory Orchestra. Between 2013 and 2019, he lived in our community. He served as Putney's Music Director. Kaylin is a son, a brother, an educator, opera singer, composer, conductor, coach, mentor, and friend to many of us at Putney. I feel privileged to have worked with him in my freshman year. Lastly, Kalen is what stands between us and our diplomas. <laughs> so without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Kalen Manson. Hey y'all, I'm back. <laughs> It feels so sort of surreal to be back on this hill with all of you. And I want to greet, of course, gathered family, friends. I have to greet my friends and colleagues on this marvelous faculty. I've missed you. But of course, I'm here to greet you, the class of 2022. This is your moment. And I'm really honored and touched that you thought to ask me to speak to you today, because we're here to celebrate you as you prepare to leave the cell. And some of these tropes you've heard already in a lot of speeches that you've heard today. But I hope to give you a different context of which to think about them. But first, a shameless plug, please come back for reunions and events and concerts and harvest festivals. And as your paths wind and diverge from each other and from this place, remember that there will always be parts of you here in the barn, in the floorboards of Calder Hall and barns, in the classrooms, along the truck paths, you'll still be here. And as it is your moment and these lovely diplomas await, I promise not to take too much time, but I want to share a few thoughts with you that I hope you'll keep with you in taking your learning and your experiences and your growth out into the world to communities that will be new to you. Or some of you are returning closer to home and that community will feel very different. It's kind of the magic of going to a boarding school, isn't it? There's been a lot of talk about change and the need for change and how you can make change or be a part of change. And it becomes different when someone calls you a change maker. Sounds kind of grandiose and self-important, doesn't it? I didn't realize how, that feeling until it was used in reference to me a couple of years ago, and it felt uncomfortable at first. But change-making is pretty grueling, gritty, deeply reflective work that can leave you feeling extremely lonely, especially when like I do, you spend most of your time engaging people at every turn. The world can feel noisy, cacophonous, unruly, and yet behind all of that, there's the potential for some really transformative and unifying harmony, much like sing. Yeah, I'm going there. It's an obvious pivot, but I might as well go there. It's the mantle, it's the tradition that every music director has held and it's a part of what we distinctly carry forward. We steward it in our own way with our own set of skills and strengths. But yet few on this hill and in the history of this hill have ever really had the benefit of being at the center of sing and knowing what that means. It's kind of like being in the eye of a hurricane or at the point of the funnel, or to quote Robin Williams from The Birdcage, like riding a psychotic horse toward a burning stable. <laughs> but at the same time, there's something that magical that happens when you're on that podium, because you get to see, even in small ways, how you can get the whole community to shift ever so slightly to sing a new song or to sing old familiar songs with a new spirit. But in order to do this work, and no, you're not taking notes, but I hope it delves in there, 
you have to listen really intensely and acutely. You have to keep your ears open. And when you go into a community, one that's new to you or one that's you're rediscovering, one of the things that change makers do is they do a listening tour. And sometimes this happens before and after you do the work that you're going to do. And before and after a sing, before any sound got made, I could hear people engage each other and I could track how they engaged me and how that changed day by day and week by week. I heard their concerns. I heard what people were angry about, passionate about, what seemed urgent. Birthdays, please sing mine today. Not mine, <laughs> but at a sing. People talked about what they wanted to protect and what they wanted to cultivate, what they were darn tired of. And when you ascended the podium, or when I ascended the podium, I could get a real barometer, a front row seat to the dynamics amongst the different sections, the competition between the tenors and the basses. I could notice who was there and who was always missing. <laughs> But then as the singing begins, you can listen in and through the mass of sounds and hear the sections and hear individual voices within the sections and hear when those voices would rise and when they would go silent when the music said otherwise. And when did the silence or when did the loudness inversely mean defiance or disagreement, right? Taking all of that in, I could decide moment by moment, thinking on my feet, what was the role I needed to take? Did I need to get in the faces of the basses and tell them to sing up the octave and not down? Did I need to walk on the benches to the tenors and sing notes at them with them in their octave to help them out? Did I need to give an encouraging glance to the sopranos just so they would go a little harder for that high note? But all of that was just to gather the community to the goal of a better harmony, a better openness of expression that could transcend our individuality and uplift us collectively, or sometimes just make us sit soberly to reflect. Anyway, this ability to acutely listen, sometimes to make a proactive gesture, listen again, reflect on what you hear, and then respond. Notice I did not say react, I said respond. It's been a practice that has served me in all the work that I've done since I've left this place, on the boards of directors, on panels, starting a new company. It's helped me make whatever change much more real with any community that I've been in contact with. And so you all now are preparing to leave this community, enter new communities, forming your own with your lived experience and fresh ideas. But in order to listen clearly, you have to listen to what is and not what you think it is. You have to put all of your biases on the table. You've practiced this well at this institution, but that work never stops. You have to examine them, consider whether they come from facts, opinions, rumors, what's the source. But then you observe and observe some more but more important, importantly, you participate with your ears and eyes open, listening with your eyes. There's a little favorite parlor trick that happens every, happened every Harvest Festival when I was music director. That hall back there would be full of people and there will always be two stray voices, maybe three, that either entered late or just wanted to sit with their family. And sometime right after a song, I would go, hey, you, you, and you. Your section's over there. Now, some people would be like, oh my God, his hearing is amazing. How did you hear all the things? And yes, I, my, director, my directional hearing's pretty good. But I was listening with my eyes because usually the six person radius around the people who were singing the wrong part uh, would be very visually distinct. There would be one person going, oh my god, this is great, and what are they singing? <laughs> or the person who was singing the wrong part would give me this look, and I would never know who that person was, but they would look right at me across the din going, help! <laughs> so yes, 
Reading the room, whether it's big or small, is important. Listening with your eyes. But when you do both of those things, listening with your eyes and with your ears and with your heart open, you can discern the role that you want to take on, what dialogues you want to have, what changes are yours to champion, and what changes are yours to leave way for others to champion. You can to discern when you need to raise your voice in leadership, or when, just as importantly, you need to be a voice of solidarity and support. You get to decide when you must show up, or when you must decidedly and loudly be absent. So, one of my last points. As you all begin to craft your life and your space out in this world, another major part of making change is that as you do create that space and hold that space for yourself, be sure that you leave room in that vision to hold and uplift others. Make sure that these others, though, are not yes people. Make sure that they are people who will challenge you and keep you honest, hold you accountable even when it's uncomfortable, and show that even when you falter and make mistakes like this community has, like the faculty and administrators have, that they will show you that you are worthy of love and respect and consideration. And the compact, folks, is that you will do the same for them. Now go forth, singing all of your different songs, returning to this hill periodically to reconnect. And I want to offer one more song to you. No, I am not going to sing. I want you to think of the evergreen favorite sing song. Probably, I think, during my year, it ended up being, I think, four of the six graduations, the senior song. It talks about the seasons and the years going by. And there's always work to be done, and we all have our part of that work to do. But the refrain, the linchpin of this song, is not a statement of what one person might or must do but it is an invitation to collective work and responsibility. It is an invitation to community with three words. Will you go? So, class of 2022, how will you go? How might we go together? I wish you all the joy, growth, challenges, and eventual success that's coming for you. And remember, when you hit those parts of your path that are really rocky, rough, and when the road forward, the way forward, seems like an impossible scramble, remember that you're not alone, that you have all of us, and we go with you. Congratulations.
Samuel Stone Benjamin. Celeste Hubbard. Juan Diego Del Prado. So it's a 
Cecile Libby Hahn. Josephine Alice Tahir. Moses. Lane Olivia Jesslin. 
Alexandra Patterson Kaplan. Isabel Eleanor Sequoia McCarthy. James Metor Preston. Giovanni Salvatore Maria Calabrese. Tepper. Karis Lila 
Lord Mess and I. Evelyn Faye Harris. Samuel James. <laughs> Luca Angelo Valentino Mercules Borsa. <laughs> Congratulations to the class of 2022. <laughs>